Hey there, it's Joe Darlington from Being James Bond, and I'm here to talk to you about... Are, are we really doing this? Uh, Is yeah. this happening? I, 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 I can't see how we can't do this. I'm, I had to wear the onesie, dude. We're talking about Goldfinger. <laughs> Is this real life? Is this is this real life? Is that David at the dentist? Yeah. Is this real life? Yeah. <laughs> Look, there there's very few times that I can actually wear this thing. Certainly not out in public. So with you, I feel comfortable. Well, I hope you don't feel that comfortable. Well, we'll, we'll just run with it. Okay. It won't be for the whole day. It'll just be for this Goldfinger discussion. Right. By the way, so we're we are we're we're sitting in front of the Goldfinger, talking about. Goldfinger, yeah. and there's a particular reason. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to kind of bring up the whole premise? Yeah, well, here we are again. We did our series where we talked about the first, uh, each actor's first film, because I was pitching the idea that I thought the first was always the best because that's when they try to make a Bond movie. Uh, results were mixed at best yeah. for that one. But 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 more on proving your theory, I yeah, think. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Um, then we decided, well, in turn, or the last always the worst. They always do. They always go out on a stinker, and I think pretty, pretty. We were pretty much in agreement that the answer was more or less yes. That definitely proved out. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think you all agreed also. Yeah, for the most part. Sadly, right. Yeah, uh, right. So after we just after we kind of spent all those videos bashing on the the weakest ones, we decided to talk about another theory, which is each actor's third film tends to be where they hit their stride. Yes, and that's. More or less, pretty agreed upon in um, the larger community, but we will. We're, we're going to have to talk about it. I mean, that's the thing. So this is this is almost. I, I want to say this is like a point counterpoint, but we're probably going to be in more agreement than others. Mm -hmm. But for some weird reason, and these are these strange Bond franchise anomalies. The third one, um, a lot of things become more comfortable. You know, maybe yeah. it's the writers, maybe it's the actor, maybe it's you know just the, even the producers mm. are finding their way through this Bond actor. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, th it's, I think that they tend to, again, the first one, they kind of come out swinging, and then they sort of, you know, readjust, mm -hmm. you know, and then they kind of do their sophomore Bond film, which, again, they kind of go from the, the first one, make some adjustments, yeah. the results can vary. Uh, results may vary. By the third one, they seem to be in their groove, and the Bond actor, I think, gets much more comfortable in the role. Yes. For one thing. Yeah, so let's let's take this step by step because I think Goldfinger, it's a good one to start with mm. because arguably when you think of iconic Bond and all the different parts right. and the pieces, Goldfinger stands out. I mean, people yeah. really think Goldfinger, when, when a newscast talks about Bond, they tend yeah. to use excerpts yeah. from Goldfinger. So yeah. let's start with the plot, the overall plot of Goldfinger. First of all, I, I think we're both in agreement that this does stand out as one of Connery's more iconic ones. It may not be your favorite. Yeah. Right, right, right. Is it your favorite? Uh, strictly in terms of, well, I, is it my favorite Connery? Mm -hmm. It's not. Okay. Uh, Mine either. Yeah. I, I mean, and it's one of those where I kind of feel like dare I say it, it's a teeny bit overrated, possibly. Mm. I, I, I noticed that Goldfinger is the film when you meet an older, casual Bond fan. Right, uh, and and you talk about James Bond, and they say, "Oh, I love James Bond." Oh, well, what, what, which one is the? Uh, and they'll just say Goldfinger. Yes. Well, Goldfinger. I saw Goldfinger like I don't know how many times, etc. And you know, I get it. I mean, it's certainly iconic. It's got elements that have stayed with us until this day. Mm -hmm. um, it's. I mean, it's beyond iconic, frankly. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and I I wouldn't call it my personal favorite. And by the way, it's interesting because I find that when I interview some family members that were of that age in the 60s to mm. really be a part of the Bond push. Yeah. They do remember Goldfinger, and I, had, I think a lot of that has to do with the marketing. I mean, Goldfinger wasn't yeah. just released as a big deal. Yeah. It was tied to other films that were subsequently released. It would be Goldfinger and this film, Goldfinger yeah, 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 and that yeah. film. Right. And so for, I don't know, five, six years, they yeah. were pummeled with Goldfinger. Sure. I will say, I'm, I'm so happy you're saying this because I feel like it's going to be a mutual killing <laughs> of people out there. Um, for some reason, I really like this film, but it's not one that I watch that often. Yeah. Like I will go to Thunderball and and certainly Doctor No much more. Mm. And I just recently watched From Russia with Love and You Only Live Twice, which by the way, From Russia with Love, I told you on the phone, yeah. blew my mind again. Yeah. It's like yeah. I rediscovered yeah. something magical. Mm. But for Goldfinger, I don't know. Like it didn't even put it up in my roster. 
Yeah. It's an oddly... Not, I don't want to say dull, but but it does. It, there's a lot of slowness to Goldfinger for something that, I mean, it seems like they went from kind of hard-boiled spy films to doing something that was a little more friendly, you know, uh, almost kind of candy-ish, cotton candy, junk food. Mm -hmm. um, you, you would think it'd be a lot of quick hits, fun, get in, get out, but yeah, there's a long lull in this movie where not a lot happens, and frankly, the fact that Bond is himself an inactive participant in a lot of what's going on around him things are happening for to me him. yeah i mean he's literally like halfway through the film he gets knocked on the head and there you know and, and that's he's a captive till just a couple minutes short of the finale right or during the finale really so so let's talk about the plot overall yeah um, from a plot standpoint, I do like the plot. Yeah. I think that it follows, you know, some intelligence. It, to me, it doesn't have a ton of wasted scene. I agree with you. There is that middle part of the movie mm -hmm. that has a lot of exposition. But to me, I, I guess I didn't bother me as much as it probably bothered you because I think it was a way to flesh out the different characters. Mm -hmm. um, we'll talk about the bad guy in a second, but fleshed out the bad guy and his plan. To me, the problem I had with the Goldfinger plot was almost the casualness mm. of what's going on. Yeah. Um, and part of that was Connery's portrayal. Yeah. So if you take a look at yeah. Connery and Dr. No, in Dr. No, he's really no nonsense. Yeah. And from Russia with Love, the stakes are high. Mm. And there's espionage. And, yeah. but, but he's got a certain amount of calm cockiness, yeah. but it's, it's used very sparingly. Right. This entire film, he's like the cock of the walk. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, he's yeah. smiling, he's like yeah. winking at the camera, he's not yeah, literally, yeah. but right. he is like, he's almost like too confident yeah. that it doesn't feel like there's a lot of jeopardy. Almost almost to the point of being tongue-in-cheek, where it's, yes. it's kind of, we're, where we're, we're winking at the camera a little bit saying, we're all having fun here, you know. When he does that elevator thing to the guard, yeah. when he's being, you know, held in Kentucky and he, he just smiles and goes down, yeah. and that's what sends the guard in, yeah. to, to me, like, I just, I was like, no, you're... You're not this mm. deadly, ruthless individual. It's mm. there's something amiss there. Yeah, right. Yes, it's right, and it's a funny scene too because you kind of go to yourself. Did the guard really think there's an elevator in there? <laughs> like, um, <laughs> right. You know. <laughs> Come on, but, man. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely right. I mean. I mean. Plot wise, in terms of like the villain's plan, I think is frankly pretty flawless, and yes. it's one of the. Uh, one of the few examples where I think they, they took a big liberty from the, the book and it works, you yeah. know, it works very well. Uh, the idea that instead of trying to actually take all the gold out to, to set up the bomb, you know, et cetera, yeah. I think that really works. Make his gold worth more. Yeah. But, but the trick is though, then, then how do you fill up all that other time? You know what I mean? Cause then you have like this long lingering scene where he's telling the plot to the, to the gangsters, right. only to bump them off afterwards. Um, I've had people kind of argue that point with me, like, well, well, he just lulled them into his false sense of security before he... And I'm like, yeah, no, I'm still not really getting that. But why tell them the plot, then? Right, why the get into great detail them. of the plot if, you, if you're only going to... If they're never going to leave that room again. Right. Uh, I, I mean, and the, the obvious answer is, well, it's for the audience. So the audience understands what's going on. And, and that makes perfect sense. But mm -hmm. then again, why bump off the, the, the gangsters? Why... So yeah, there's there's a lot. Like again, it's not that the plot is is bad; it's very good. But right. it, but it, I just don't know if the rest of the two hours is filled properly with with what could have been there. Yeah, and I think for me, I'll tell you exactly where it slows down for me. Mm. And this is this is guilty in some of the films. People are going to be like, I can't believe David and Joe are ripping apart Goldfinger. <laughs> have you seen this new video? Yeah. Um, is really at the end when they go to Fort Knox. And, and I know mm. it's a beautiful set and it's amazing, but that whole thing with the army guys and the faking it and all that other stuff, yeah. um, and even the battle, you know, that little mini battle with Goldfinger, mm. I, I just, it feels almost like tacked on. And, and that's because I loved the other moments of Goldfinger. Yeah. I didn't mind the plot holes and gaps mm. that I think a lot of people would, would check out in the first three quarters of the film yeah. because I find a good Bond film doesn't need to be flawlessly plotted out. Right. It needs to take you on a ride yeah. so quickly and so well and so mm. in such a dazzling way right. that you forget those little things. Sure. You forgive those things. Exactly, yes. The, you know, Spielberg had a really great, um, watching him talking about the Raiders of the Lost Ark films, 
And he says, you know, sometimes when you're writing a story, you find yourself, you paint yourself into a corner. And he says, sometimes the best way out of it is just to run so quickly through the wet paint that hopefully no one sees your footprints. Uh, and, and yes, I think that works. And again, I, you also have to sort of caveat and say, yes, these, this was a time when people saw the film one time in the theater, you know, maybe again on a re-release, et cetera. Yeah. You didn't have it on home video where you were constantly dissecting every, every nook and cranny of the film as we do today, uh, which is fun. But, um, so yeah, I mean, all of that is certainly valid. And, and again, the film is not, the, the film is certainly entertaining, you know? So again, it's, it's hardly a rip on the film, but I, yeah. but I, again, I just don't know if it's, it, when you look at it in terms of 24, almost 25 films, uh, you know, and you say, well, where does it stand and how does it rank up against the other ones? Well, I, again, I think the other ones fill the, the, the space a little bit more, uh, without lengthy times, you know, Bond sitting in captivity or, you mm -hmm. know. So, I mean, again, it all works. I mean, of course, we, like, still in, still talking about just the plot, the, the romance between he and uh, Honey Ryder. Uh, not, boy, I'm going to lose my bond. Honey Ryder. <laughs> You're out, sir. Oh good day God. to you. Oh, I terrible. said good day. I'm, fa I'm facing the Dr. No uh, <laughs> display over here. Uh, uh, with him and Pussy Galore, yeah. you know, again, it, 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 uh, it does sort of brilliantly come together at the end because, you know, Bond it has to seduce the femme fatale in this to win her over to his side, and that's right. essentially how the plot is foiled. Mm -hmm. um, which which I, you kind of might not even pick that up the first couple few times you see it. Right. So, you know, th that part is flawless as well. So Yeah, I, I think what what I love about this, and we're, we're seeing something already happen, people tend to go to Goldfinger as the go-to Connery film yeah. when using as an example. Yeah. But when I asked the Bond fan base that we know what their mm. favorite Connery film is, yeah. I hardly ever hear Goldfinger. Yeah. Now, I know for me, for example, I like Goldfinger, the bad guy. we got to talk about the bad guy. Right, right, yeah. I think he's a very good bad guy. I think he's snarky. I love his witticisms. He's well-written. Mm. Um, you know, he he's not this, you know, Red Grant muscular guy. He doesn't need to be. Mm. He wields a lot of power. His plan is absolutely maniacal. Mm. And even the killing of the goons and things like that, as much as you're right, it's a throwaway to see, yeah. show, hey, look, it's poison gas. Yeah. Um, the fact that he does it means that this guy's a take no prisoner. Yeah. yeah. And just seems dangerous. But what did you yeah. think of, like, the bad guy? Um, oddly, I've never really been a big Goldfinger fan as a, okay. as a, bad, a bad guy. And, and, I, and it's honestly... For, for is he one cartoonish thing, to you? Is that not necessarily? Right. Um, in fact, maybe even not enough. Frankly, he oh. he sort of seems like this regular schlub, you know. And and I kind of find that the best Bond villains usually have a little bit of that sort of mirror image of James Bond, right? Where they can kind of you know battle play off each other a little bit. Um, and I see Goldfinger. I mean, he, he dresses poorly. He's a schlub. I mean, they purposely show him like, you know, snoring and scratching his face and yeah. the, in the and sleeping in the car. So, I mean, they, they don't make him, you know, they, they purposely show that this is not a nice guy, not a yes. guy you'd want to hang around with. Um, so, mission accomplished in, in that respect. But again, <laughs> I, I I never found him to be a very challenging player. And by, by the way, the fact that he's dubbed throughout the entire film, to me, kind of sort That's of... That's disconcerting. It's hard to, yeah. like, like shut your brain up and not notice that. Um, so, not my favorite villain, yeah. but I do understand the kind of... The, the interesting, you know, what I, again, mirror image thing, not quite, but it does sort of show, you know, Bond, Bond can win a golf match on his own accord. Mm -hmm. Goldfinger has to cheat. You know, Bond can score with the ladies. Right. Goldfinger needs to. So we, I get that part of it, too. You're nailing what I think I like about Goldfinger when I mm. peel back the layers. If I take a look at Ian Fleming's writings yeah. of bad guys... They're always kind of schlubby guys with disconnects. You know, the mm. ruddy skin, the sunburn, yeah, yeah. you know, overweight, you mm. know, snorting like a pig, yeah, all these yeah. things. Cheating. Right. How many bad guys cheat yeah. and cheat at cards? So yeah. to me, it was this whole package of this like absolutely vile, wouldn't want to be in the same room with yeah. type of guy who's just, I mean, he's this multi-billionaire with gold and yet yeah. he's cheating at cards. That's how horrible right. this individual is. Yes, so yes. I, I guess I'm drinking in all of that aspect. Yeah. Right, and that yeah, and that is very valid. Yes, it, it's and I, and right, and it does sort of come back to Fleming. Like, why why would this guy who can have anything he wants? Why does he feel compelled to to cheat somebody out of a card game for yeah. for not much money? Right, you know, yeah, it, it is right. I mean, that that is pretty well done. I, I just kind of wonder could it have been fleshed out better? And you're certainly comparing it to like like name a Bond bad guy from one of the movies that you think is like oh. 
he's like the Bond bad guy. Well, as we were talking, I was sort of thinking of Kamal Khan. And I was oh. thinking, now there's th that to me is is a villain. Octopus. Octopus. He like he's a little more to me the, the, the kind of mirror equivalent of Roger Moore. You know where mm. they're kind of like these sort of playboy types. You know, men of leisure. Um, and he also cheated at. He was sitting at, at backgammon, cheating. That's right. That's right. Um, so again, yeah. which is obviously a kickback to Goldfinger, to the point where the guy takes the dice and crushes them like odd job. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so, but I and I think in that respect, I kind of like that slightly better. Because again, it's it's he's a little more kind of matched with more, um, but still does that cheating thing. So I, I kind of feel like, again, as the films go forward, sometimes they can fine tune little things, yeah. you know, and get them a little bit better. Um, which, to which a lot of people might say, "Dude, you're really saying Kamal Khan's a better bad guy than Goldfinger?" N well, not necessarily better, but again, they did sort of get that part down a little more as far as I'm I concerned. think. Octopussy must have been your first sexual partner because you <laughs> love. That film, <laughs> unconditionally. It, it, oddly enough, it's it's not my favorite Bond film of all time. It's True. not even in my top two. I maybe three. It's kind of one of those wow. where it sort of does this a lot. That you know, once I get that, once I get past my top two, yeah, the, the next couple fluctuate. Um, but yeah, it's it's a big one. On my list. All right, so so the the Bond girl. Mm. Let's talk about uh, the Bond girl. Yeah. In this film, I mean, what do you? Th how does she stack up? Excuse the pun. Yeah. Uh, in, in alignment to the other Bond girls from the other films. I think she is I think she's great. I think she's awesome. And I and I and I think we should talk about all of the Bond girls in this movie because I think they all really work. But the but um you know Pussy Galore is spectacular yeah. in terms of she's she's a Bond girl who gives Bond a run for his money. Yeah. You know, like he's he's trying to be charming, he's trying to be cute, he's trying to be cheeky, doesn't work. You know, eventually he kind of wears her down, but it takes some work. Yeah. You know, she doesn't just in fact I'm I you know when I Maybe I shouldn't even touch this one, but when I hear people complaining, certain people complaining about no the, the No Time to Die trailer and talking about how woke it's going to be because the uh, because the, the character gives Bond sass and says, I'm going to shoot you in the leg if you get in my way. The one that works. All right. I always say, like, have you ever seen a James Bond movie before? Have you ever even not noticed that the girls in the really good films always sass Bond? You know, going back to Dr. No, even... I promise I won't steal your shells. I promise you, you won't either. Like, they all That's give true. him a hard time. Yeah. I mean, unle yeah. unless, again, the good ones. Yeah. You know, the ones that are not written very well might just roll over and fall on their back at the, the sight of Sean Connery or Roger There's been Moore, a few like that, yeah. Right, and, but they're, they're the minority, frankly. Yeah. So, anyway, so yes, Pussy Glory, I think, is, is an incredible um, counterpoint to James Bond. I think so, too. I think, you know, I think some people will portray... Her weakness and hold on a second, she was fighting him, fighting him, and now mm. they're in love. Yeah. But then, couldn't you say the same thing about Madeline and Bond and Spectre? You know, you know, leave me alone, get away from me, mm. get away from me. Train fight, rip, close off. Yeah, I mean, right, right, you know, right. it's yeah. and those are in two very different eras. But sure. I will say, even the Matheson uh, sisters, yeah, uh, who, by the way, the Matheson mom and dad must Masterson? be so Masterson. Isn't you know that what I said? Matheson. <laughs> Damn it, they would have never noticed, Joe. You know how much they get on me for pronunciation and you got to fly in and do that? I'm out of here. We, no. go, we, we go quick, you know, we don't pause. But I, I had We're like a Bond film. It just goes quick and you don't even notice. There you go. Um, but but the, even the sisters, yeah. um, they bring their own type of personality. And they're very different. Yeah. You know, who are you? You know, and, and I mean, that's like an iconic thing. Then you've got the gold woman. I mean, that just brings mm. it right in. Yeah. Then all of a sudden, you've got the very different sister moment. Yes. She still dies. Yeah. Which yeah. is kind of dark. Yeah. It. Yeah, I, I tell you, I really, I think the sisters are fantastic. Because, again, they're so well cast, too, by the way. Because, like, the one, you could see her being, like, a little more brash. You know, the one who kind of would be out there a little more might get herself into trouble. Because she's kind of, you know, a little, yeah. little bit of a wild child. And then the other sister, who you could tell is a little more... You know, probably was a little more the teacher's pet than than her crazy sister. <laughs> so I mean, and the character, the actresses play that so perfectly. They do. They do. They what, offset each other great. What did you think of the gypsy fight? Do you think that was realistic? Are we we're crossing movies now. Yeah, I was just trying to get you. <laughs> I was trying. I was trying to get you to do a funny rider again. He's staring at a from Russia with love poster. People, Will you be patient with the man. That's right. As I mispronounce everybody's the, name. The, the Zariski archive is is three dimensional. It's, it's everywhere. It, it is, and this this proves it. By the way, I, I will mention because I have to. Uh, style. Hmm. So arguably one of the best Connery style films. I mean, the three piece Prince of Wales check suit. Yeah. Um, 
I mean, Connery's style in that film is iconic. Yeah. Everything yeah. fits, everything looks, it, it would look well-placed today yeah. as it does back then. The, the golf outfit, spot on. Perfect. I mean, yeah. the golf outfit. Well, you have yeah. that, don't you? I do. Yeah. yeah. I mean, right here. Yeah. yeah. The golf outfit is perfect. It's so perfect. Everything, I think, they just really came to the rhythm. And, and obviously, then, by the time they get to um, uh, Thunderball, yeah. I mean, that's just, like, over the top because yeah. it's, it's so iconic from the casual Bond thing. Mm. So, from a sartorial aspect, this is, like... Like at the pinnacle of, of green, all of green that. Green check mark for sure, absolutely. And so here's another sector that I think this one's going to win out. Gadgets and the fun mm. factor. Okay. Kind of yep. combined. Yeah. I mean, this the scene with Q, the DB5. Yeah. What, what do you think? Yeah, I, again, this is, you know, yeah, yeah, there's one thing you can never take away from Goldfinger is the fact that it, it really did sort of hit that mark. Um, again, so many things that we right now look back on as being just just a standard part of James Bond yeah. comes into play in Goldfinger and I think the Q scene is that I mean we again this we had to you know the first movie the second movie it, it took us till the third film to get a full blown Q scene that they really kind of went in and said we can really take advantage of this and have fun with it and do stuff yeah uh so yes that was spectacular the gadgets are great they work great. Um, again, they're not over the top. They are very, you know, just seem like yes, this is something that he would come up with, as you know, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, and, and it does lend to the fun factor, like you said. I mean, the DB5 scene oh. in the film is spectacular. I mean, it is it is a great scene. And by the way, I love that Bond is not infallible in that, and that you know, just one big old mirror was able to sort of take out Bond. Yes, you know? yes, I like those little moments, and even yeah. the. Um, you know, the tracker, you know, in the yeah. heel of the shoe and mm -hmm. things like that. And, yeah. you know, the things in the shaver. I mean, there, there's, I'm just looking over here. There were so many little gadgetry fun. And I loved in this movie the brand new interplay between Q and Bond. Yes. This, this sense of disdain, yet yeah. appreciation and respect mm -hmm. that is clearly there. I never yeah. joke about my work. Yes. I mean, so iconic. Yeah. Right. And, and again, I mean, that, that scene with Des I mean, right, that does. It's funny because, again, you saw Desmond in From Russia With Love. Two very respectable coworkers, not a whole lot of byplay, etc. Yep. All of a sudden, here comes Goldfinger, and now the dynamic between James Bond and Q is set in stone, and will carry through until the twenty, until the nineteenth Bond film. Yeah, you know, I mean, yeah. it's it's a, it was a staple that stayed with us forever, and it was, you know, again, it's amazing sometimes when you look back and you realize how early they got some of these things right. You know, that's true. That's a good point. All right, the music. Of mm. Goldfinger. Heard it a million times. I'm yep. sure you've gone over the soundtrack that's got fingerprints on it, as you like to say. What'd you think of the music? Uh, I, I love it. And I mean, it's not one of those that I would necessarily pull out, you know, off the CD rack and play in the car. Um, but it's one of those that it is so iconic to that specific film. Yes. You you hear that soundtrack. I mean, there, there are some, and again, John Barry is brilliant, but there are some of his soundtracks that you'll, you'll somebody could just play a random. Barry track, you'll be like, like, and you'll be like, which one is that again? Yeah. I can't remember, but but you know Goldfinger, you know it is yeah. it is like I mean that, that's even one of those where we when you got the the DVDs the um that had had the the original menus and stuff mm -hmm. and it plays that Goldfinger music and it's just so iconic to that film. I agree, and I think what one of the reasons why I do like the soundtrack is the song, and yeah. the song by Dame Shirley Bassey is just so amazing. As a, as a song, but what they did was, and they don't always do this in every Bond film, is they incorporated it into the soundtrack. Yes. So when he goes to Kentucky, you know, as he's driving there, you hear the sweeping, na 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 And they hold it out. There's like four or five different versions yeah. of that song interplayed as part of the soundtrack. And yeah. that, to me, is just amazing. I, I totally agree. I, like I said, I love it when, when John Barry puts that stamp, you know, on a film. And then this one clearly does that. Yeah. You know, we don't often, when you and I talk about films, we talk about plot, we talk about Bond, we talk about what we liked, and we don't often talk about something very interesting. And you, you mentioned it earlier on, around pacing. Mm. You know, some Bond films slowly evolve, build up to a crescendo, explode, mm. and then calm down, yeah. which is kind of what you want a Bond film to do. Mm. But with Goldfinger, what did you, you, you remarked that you didn't think the pacing was ideal. Right. Yeah, I, I think it's, you know, like some parts work fantastic. I mean, the pre-titles is a great example of when you can, you, you take that, 
Yeah, I mean, it's it's odd to me that some of the Bond films don't take enough advantage of that pre-title into just doing their own thing and having like a little five-minute Bond movie onto itself. Yeah. Uh, this one does it, and it works perfectly, and it, it gets your adrenaline up. By the time that, you know, pre-title is finished and you've gotten everything, you know, but the kitchen sink in it, and then the the blasting uh, Shirley Basie titles come up, your adrenaline's up. You're yeah. ready for a Bond film, you know? So, and then it's, it, I think the pacing is pretty good. I mean, I, and again, I I, and it's, it's, it's funny because I, like, I have to be careful when I pick on it for being so slow because there's so many times today where I'm saying, slow it down, guys, <laughs> slow it down. The fast let and us, the Furious. Let it, right, let us enjoy some of the scenery a little bit. Let's smell the flowers a little bit. So the, I mean, we you know the the golf scene is great. Mm -hmm. uh, the Miami hotel scene is great. I mean, everything is going fine. Again, right up until after the laser scene, and then it just really does sort of slow down. And, and again, you get good characters, you get good things happening. We explore the plot a bit. We get it. Um, Bond has a couple good scenes with Pussy Galore. Great, but for the most part, that stuff really does sort of. I mean, it's almost like when you see them kind of panning across the Kentucky stud farm, you know? Mm -hmm. It's almost like that's when you're kind of going, okay, get ready for some slowness, yes. you know? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I've, I've often joked about, like, you know, we talk about locations, and, you know, I always I always talk about the great, you know, U, U.S. Bond locations. Hmm. We got great ones. We got New York, San Francisco, Las Vegas, New Orleans. I always forget Kentucky because it's so boring. Yeah, but that chicken. <laughs> it's right. That chicken. Um, so... I I agree. I think that there are some pacing issues. However, I can't help but put it into the filter of the 1960s. Yeah. And I do this with Thunderball. Mm. Like everybody, I mean, I always get here all the time, especially with younger people that watch Thunderball. Mm. They're like, oh, I love Thunderball. But that underwater scene and battle <laughs> goes on forever and ever. But, yeah. but back then... People yeah. appreciated that mm. slow drink of water. Yes. You know, just build it up for me. They didn't have, you know, the input. You know, mm. before we sat down here, I think Joe and I checked our phone six times. <laughs> all the different channels. And it's yeah. like, quick, I need input. I need input. Yep. Yep. So if I put it into the slower mm. kind of mindset of the 1960s, drink it in, it probably, to me, doesn't have any pacing issues. Yeah. I'm talking about the impatient David Zaritsky, who's 52, right. yeah. who's going to probably die soon <laughs> and wants things to hurry up. There yeah. are some pacing issues. Yeah. Yeah I, yeah, I would agree with that. I mean, you, you do have to, you know, look at it through the lens in which it was made. And, and um, you know, so, yeah, that that's fair. And, and again, I, I do, like I said, I do sort of feel a little hypocritical complaining that it's too slow when most of them are just, just too bombastic and please slow it down. So... We now have to answer a question. Mm. We started out, we covered a lot of different aspects very quickly. Yeah. Our pacing wasn't off. Um, but number one, mm. do, we, do you feel like Goldfinger found its stride? It's, is it a solid thing? And I'm going to add one to it. Do you think it's the best Connery? Mm. It's, you know, it's funny. And I, I kind of find, I'm over, like, as, a, as I'm thinking of my answer, I'm already sort of re reminding myself of what I said a couple times when we talked about our firsts, where I was like, I think empirically you can argue that it is, but on a personal level. Um, so I, I don't know if, I mean, again, I, I think, you know, I think Connery will get his best one after Goldfinger. In terms of the character finding their their kind of sweet spot, right. I, I would say it's kind of hard to argue with it. Because, again, yeah. Connery does, I mean, he was, he, like you said, there's no nonsense in, in Dr. No and... From Russia with Love, he's he's little, cracking a little more of a smile, but still, for the most part, mm -hmm. here he's he's kind of chilling out. You know, he's he's pretty chill, maybe even a little too much, um, but he's comfortable in the role now. The and again, we're getting the elements of Bond that that will stay with us forever. Uh, I mean, you, it's hard to argue with the the theory that if it wasn't for Goldfinger, we might not have James Bond today. I mean, this was the... That's true. You know, I mean, this one made the phenomenon, and this is why we sort of have it. So I can't not give this film the credit it's due. I, I like where you took this, because you said the word empirically, and you're right. If you just went by the numbers, there mm -hmm. was a, a checklist of Bond tropes yeah. and, and different characteristics. Yeah. Goldfinger would probably be the one that closest gets to it, certainly within the Connery mm -hmm. era. So if I was, you know, counting, a bean counter, if you will, right. um, I would check all these off. Yeah. I still find, though, and I love how you put this, the fingerprints. Mm. The most fingerprints are not on Goldfinger. Yeah. 
Yeah. And and I and may, it may be that I'm too familiar with it or it's mm. too perfect. You know, I love I love things in life that are a little askew. Yeah. So yeah, I just I don't I don't typically go to this as my favorite one. Yeah. But I do yeah. think it found its stride for sure. Right. I, again, the, the, there are things you just can't argue with, but right. But it's not going to be the first one I'm going to going to grab. Okay. So now that we've done that one, which mm. was arguably one of the easier ones. We're going to go to one that might be a little bit more challenging. Mm. We are going to fly and wave uh, judiciously to George yep. as we go over his one. Because yeah. he didn't have a second or a third. Yep. Sorry, George. Guy. Sorry, George. There's still hope. You're still <laughs> young at heart. Um, and we're going to land firmly on the spy who loved me. We're going to jump ahead a whole decade. We are. Crazy We've done that before. Like even this in the Craig era. Yeah. <laughs> Oops. This is true. This is true. <laughs> All right, Joe, thank you for having this conversation. Thank you, sir. Uh, this, Always a blast. This has been David Zaritsky. And Joe Darlington. And we'll see you all real soon. Take care. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from the Bond experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information, plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you, just because we know you. Talk to you soon.